when you're dealing with working television with series, you're you're working with a bunch of uh, <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of homeless actors. That's right. <laughs> we're looking for lunch. Uh, <laughs> but but yeah, wrangling yeah, right. cats. <laughs> Drunk, who, who, who drug addicted cats. Who are looking for a table with bagels on That's it. That's right. <laughs> Gonna go and do my convention thing. Got my costume, I'm going now. Yeah, we're having a ball. It's Star Trek, y'all. Hey, Dan, come on up. Beam me up. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a very special episode of Shuttlepod. We'll be answering some more of your fan questions and a lot more. I'm Erica LaRose, and now for your hosts, Connor Trenier and Dominic Keating. Uh, circling back to, you know, uh, budgets and, you know, uh, Star Trek in general being quite expensive, I know the, der- the inspiration for our Shuttlepod show was uh, Shuttlepod 1, which was meant to be the bottle show, wasn't it? Um, it sort of became something else, but wasn't that, uh, you know, right, at the, the end I, of season one, we spent a lot of money already. Yeah, I, I, f- I was very involved in the writing of that show. Uh, I wrote it with Brandon, but I think I probably, in terms of the balance, I was maybe perhaps a little more involved, certainly in the dialogue. And uh, Great episode, by the way. We've, mm-hmm. As actors, we just you know, ate that up. In Deep Space Nine, we had two male characters. Uh, Siddig, who played the Doctor, uh, and Colin Meany. Right. And they were buddies. And... Their relationship was a wonderful element to the show. And I felt that the same thing was true with, see, with, with yeah. both Mal- with Malcolm and Tripp. You two guys were, were buddies. And the thought of being in a shuttle pod and having the false belief that en- Enterprise it. had been destroyed, mm. that all of your colleagues were dead, and that you were way too far away to ever be rescued... Mm. And that you were alone with a bottle of bourbon, if I recall, yeah. uh, and some cold blankets, or b- blankets for the cold. Right. Uh, it just seemed like a like a, a wonderful, a wonderful episode. Very often, these when you have to save money, you end up writing terrific episodes. Yeah. And uh, this was truly has always been. One of my favorite episodes. You walked up to me, and I might have been on the first day, and and, you, and I think we were talking about the episode and, and how much I, I liked it. And you said, I got to tell you, it just, page after page, it was just coming out. And you said it was just the easiest sort of process in, in writing this episode. And um, and it did. There's such great flow to the episode. Really I is. think it really also establishes our two characters for the rest of yeah. Of, of of our time on the show. You know, one of the things that's so important is that the the 19 years that I was involved from the beginning of Next Generation to the end of Enterprise, it wasn't like normal television. No. Because we a had... A whole group. We yeah. had a family. Yeah. yeah. We had people like David Livingston and Mary Howard and Herman Zimmerman mm. and Michael Westmore and... Bob Blackman. And Bob Blackman and, 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 and many, many more. Uh, right. who were with us for the whole 19 years. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. So we were a family. We could finish each other's sentences. We, right. we knew what we wanted. Uh, every morning when I would drive in, I would park my car, and Bob Blackman would be waiting in the parking lot with the drawings that he had to show me. And, and my walk in That was his office, moment to get you? That it, was his moment to get me. Kidding. And every the single day... To, to the Gary Cooper the building. And it became, if he wasn't there, I'd be depressed all day. Right, what's wrong with Bob? Yeah. <laughs> some of the costumes, I'm just looking at the show again after all these years, and some of that Zindi stuff, uh, the reptiles, those costumes are... Never mind, we, well, I wanted to actually talk about the EV suits. I mean, uh, they did, cost Did you have a fan in yours? We did. There was, a, there was a motor yeah. that was doing something. In my head. You're doing great, Dom. Yeah, You're doing yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but God, can you work better? Can you work better? Um, I, when we did Minefield, that one where I'm stuck through the leg on the Romulan ship, Scott did some serious hours out on the, on, the, on the hull of that thing with me, and he put his back out, and suddenly his uh, personal trainer, Mark, was in, and the whole thing got ergonomically redesigned, and... There were some supports for that backpack. I mean, they were they were they were they were hardcore suits to wear for any serious amount of time. The only guy that could really do it and bounce around was Anthony, 
but he was young and built like a brick yeah. you know uh, it used to literally Did those strip me down come from NASA I mean I, re I recall a conversation when we got shown these EV suits and how beautiful they were that they were they were somewhat the real deal well I would I, I think what, what Blackman, Blackman did a lot of research, mm -hmm. and I, I would get dozens and dozens of drawings and sketches and photographs, and I would get Bob's opinion, I would get the opinion of Brannon, I'd get my, my opinion, and we would uh, come up with a, a look. Right. I unfortunately was not all that involved in, in, in the comfort <laughs> angle, uh, angle of this. They look uh, great, you, you, you Don't know, bother me with comfort. <laughs> in, in retrospect, you, you should have come and told me that these suits were not yeah, we, pleasant. We probably should have. And uh, I don't think we anybody scared. ever did. <laughs> no, no I, I, no, I think it was just to keep Scott working. That, oh, uh, see, when they, Scott they, put, they, they put these uh, pillboxes yeah. that they developed, They, I mean, they just put together props that I think that would, would support that battery pack 35 pounds that backpack so that when you were in between shots you could sit there and it would it would relieve they had they they yeah, had uh, the, the apple boxes that we could sit them. and relieve without taking the whole goddamn thing off but that in itself was uh, another you know uh, i was uh, yeah these are all things that i was oh, not, not privy, privy to not, not privy to <laughs> yeah. i i gotta tell you and i know we're not doing this for deep space nine right now or for voyager but uh it was a hell of a cast, a hell of a cast. Thank you. You, Thank two, you. you two guys, uh, Billingsley, yeah. jo, Jolene, Scott, of course. I'm forgetting some, uh, but Anthony, Anthony, Anthony Linda. Yeah. Linda Parks. Uh, yeah. It, was, it, was a, it was one amazing cast. Thank you. And I think going back to the origins... Uh, it, the first show we did so was did on the spaceship. Set, when did that get set that you would take it well, back? First, we did a show on the Enterprise. Then there was going to be an overlap. So we couldn't do the second show on another starship. Right. So we decided to come up with the idea of putting it on a space station. And that became Deep Space Nine. Right. Then when Enterprise ended, ah, we can go back to a ship. And we went back to the Voyager. And uh, the whole thing with the various female captains of that ship. And then when that was over, where were we going to go? Right. Yeah. And the thought was either the future or the past. And we had been to the 23rd century, to the 24th century. The, the idea of going back to the 21st century or the 22nd century and being able to see how it all began, how warp speed began, did you basically get final say so? Or, I mean, in that final network audition that we went to at Paramount, if someone in the room there at the executive level somewhere in the... Oh, there's... Uh, we had a, there's a wonderful actor named Billy Campbell. Do you remember mm -hmm. him? Yep. Yeah. He was our choice, uh, my choice, and Gene's choice for Riker. Right. And we... No kidding. Brought him into the studio... And he had just made Rocket Man, I think it was called, mm. uh, a Rocketeer. 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 Right. And uh, getting him mixed up with Elton John. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he's vers very versatile, uh, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when he left the room, John Pike, who was president of Paramount Television at the time, said, "I was in the Navy for four years. I would not follow that guy into battle." Ah, uh, he said the death and all for that then. Oh. Yeah. And uh, so we went to our number two choice, who was a fellow named Jonathan Frakes. Right. Does Jonathan know? He must know this story. Yeah. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. God, he looked like Clark Gable when he was oh, well. a young man. I mean, you just see him up on the screen. You're like, well, now he looks just you have to you see pictures of him. Uh, he looks just like Orson Welles. <laughs> He's gotten bigger. He's got this elegant beard, and uh, he's just—he's just killing him on, as a director. Jonathan, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he is. Yeah. You know, I mean, like I was saying, in that final episode—hate it or lo love it or hate it—the two scenes I think I did with Jonathan in the uh, kitchen galley were two of the funnest scenes I ever did on the show. Same. And I did a lot of fun scenes, don't get me wrong. But uh, so you're not the, you're not among the haters. I'm not. No. Uh, uh, and I, I felt at the time, and I, it's good to hear that 
that it actually came out of an honest writing decision. But I thought also that you and Brandon were wrapping up, you know, 18 years uh, of running that show and that, that, that franchise. And I thought that that was perhaps the derivation of that final episode. But it's no, not. It was, it was something much more honest and uh, it's good to hear it. Uh, I mean, the, it was, we used to joke a bit in the trailer uh, that, you know, the shows were called Hair Trek. Where, where did that? Okay, I, I can. Where tell did you that this. come from? I, I, I was often blamed about the hair, which was absolutely incorrect. All of that came from my dear and loving friend Kerry McCluggage. Really? Kerry was. Uh, I don't know how well you knew Kerry, but he. I he, met him a couple of times. He yeah. himself had immaculate he hair. He had a bloody good head of hair, didn't he? He also was obsessed about hair, and we would get calls. Marina's hair is too long. Marina's hair is up too high. Uh, Kate's hair is not feminine enough. This, he, we got hair notes from him continually, and I, I was not in a position to tell the chairman of the studio sure. go yourself. Right. right. So we Scott's were constantly making. Uh, we were yeah. constantly making hair changes. Scott had like a. He had an insurance salesman haircut to start with <laughs> yeah. in season one. And by the end of it, he looked pretty and rugged. Yeah, he had little bangs at yeah. one point. And luckily, Jolene's hair changed. You, darling, had one. frosted tips I'd the walk into time. the makeup trailer and it literally would be a production. <laughs> <laughs> one half being frozen, the other being frosted. <laughs> so I, I, it was, I, um, I would receive a lot of notes from the studio. And when you get notes from the studio, if they're strong enough... All right. Uh, you uh, from the echelon. You you obey them. You jump yeah, to yeah. right. and uh, you don't necessarily tell the people who are involved. I got this note from the chairman of the studio, mm. so they get pissed off. It's at coming you. from you. Right. 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 Yeah. Uh, well, I tell you something that I've wanted to ask you is: uh, Did you ever keep anything from the show? Did you ever keep any memorabilia? Any props? Anything? Any sort of I, I will keepsakes? say that I, I I've. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I have yeah. you know, tons of scripts. Got tons of scripts. But uh, I, I have, everything that I have, I didn't take. It was given to me. Herman Zimmerman, right. when, like for instance, when the Enterprise crashed in one of the movies right. and it was destroyed, right. uh, there were a lot of things that were in that ship that were never going to be used again. Right. Uh, and some of them... Uh, Arrived by truck at my uh, oh, at really? my house. Oh, lovely. Um, you have a storage unit somewhere in the valley. Uh, no, well, I got some. I got, I've got I got some pieces that I think that if I ever do anything with them, I will get them involved in a Star Trek oriented nice. uh, auction for uh, for a yes. charity. Right. right. And I think some of them would. Uh, some of them are. I, I don't want to discuss what they are, but I think some of them. Mike Garner, go for, go for a bit. Some, uh, I can imagine. You don't have the four or five um, Patrick Stewart captain's chairs that kept getting lifted <laughs> off the set. Apparently, <laughs> that was a thing that you know. Every now and then, yeah. there would go one of the one of the. When, the, the we, when they were shooting chairs. Nemesis, two went in the first three weeks. I remember that distinctly. <laughs> there were captain chairs stolen, and yeah. I think somebody they started searching our cars yeah. in and out of the studio at that point. Well, but they always would have a new one in the next morning. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh -huh. <laughs> so. They probably made three at a time. I had, luckily, I had too much on my mind back in those days to worry about right. replacing <laughs> chairs. Right. Um, another question I wanted to ask you was uh, water polo, as Scott's uh, cat Jonathan Archer's passion. Where, where on earth did that idea That come all from? came from my son, Eddie. Was uh, it? Uh, who lives in... Uh, he Port played water in, polo. He lives in Portland, Oregon right. with his beautiful wife and two daughters age uh, about to be six and just turned three. Wow. Uh -oh. And uh, they, we have seen far too little of them because they were very COVID, because the kids oh, couldn't oh, do sure. anything. But we've seen them uh, f four or five times over the last couple of years, and they were down here for a week about a month ago. That's so. when we nice. first started talking about uh, getting you in the jump seat. Right. Yeah, God bless you, sir. And, uh, so uh, he was a water polo Eddie player. Was a, Eddie went to a high school very close to here called Harvard Westlake, and he was on the water polo team. He was one of the better players on the water All polo right. team, and that helped him get it into Berkeley. And he was on the water polo team, 
at Berkeley. Legitimately, wow. I think. <laughs> for, the, for the first season. And then he uh, started writing music and, and uh, that became his passion and water polo sort of faded out. But uh, It's hard to make water polo a hobby. Yeah, it's a, uh, I, I went to I've, I went to more water polo games than you could imagine I, I in my life, did. and uh, he was he was he was remarkable at it. And uh, it was a nice touch for the captain to mm -hmm. have that be. It was so sort of you know unique and uh, different. Uh, yeah, and the dog, uh, there he is. That was that was the, the idea of a dog. I was always a, a dog owner. Brannon, for some reason, was a big three musketeer. Fan, and he loved the name Porthos, oh. and uh, that's how the dog got named Porthos. And you know, just like everything else, like putting a song on the beginning of the show, which was considered sacrilegious by many. Yeah. Although I think the song was wonderful, and I, I think loved it. I, I think the visuals it. that went along with it were wonderful. It broke a tradition of Star Trek, but it didn't necessarily mean. Uh, that much to me. I think it was uh, it, it was not risky, and I think the song was terrific. And I think to this I day, I loved it. I have to say, I'll fight anyone about the song. I, I it. do find a little umbrage in season three, and I think this was one of the notes that came via the network. They put the tambourine in, and they quickened the beat. Yeah, to, I, that's that's a classic thing. I got to say, I found that irksome a bit. I think I, I got a note from one of the people at CBS, at Glorious CBS, telling me. Uh, let's make it a little bit more rock yeah. and roll, a little bit more contemporary. They were obsessed with getting a younger audience. I heard it was one of the notes put a boy band in the mess hall scenes. Is, that, was, yes. is that real? That's real? Yes. That's actually real. Yes. Well, the two, two things. It's real. <laughs> I've been telling it for years, <laughs> people. I, I, won't me I won't mention any names, no. but two of the great meetings at CBS when they took over <laughs> was... Got proper the, jobs, these people. There was a person of rather high rank who said, what if we put a boy band into the mess hall? <laughs> that way, we could have songs written that we could license and we could sell the recordings and we could, it, it could earn How money. How do you react to that, And it Rick? would be hip. Well, the answer was no. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I remember was one day I just... You take a breath and <laughs> now you just like... Yes, let's do some fan questions. Let's go back to the, the money shot. Yeah, there you yeah. are, darling. <laughs> well, so you guys, uh, we've gotten a lot of fan questions, but you've answered a lot of them already. We have. Which is great. And um, the first is from Scott Inch through Twitter. Uh, I've heard stories that William Shatner was to appear on Enterprise. How close were you guys getting him on the show? Was Bill going to come and do our show? Well, I think I heard that I, somewhere. I had a meeting. I, I, I knew Bill pretty well because he had, he had been in the movie Generations right. with us. And uh, he called me up one day and he said, let's have lunch. So I brought Manny Cotto and Brannon and we went and had lunch at some place in Hollywood with Bill. And they were both like... <laughs> they, Manny was a huge they, fan, they, wasn't they, he? They I mean, were, he grew up watching yeah, the show and... and who? Manny Koto. Oh, God. Big, big fan. And we should get into talking a little bit about his, his uh, taking the show over a bit in season four. But anyway, yes. So lunch with, those, with Bill. What happened was that uh, Bill had an idea. Or Bill's people had an idea. Somebody had an idea. And it was a two-parter. And it was relatively clever. Uh, and he, I forget what it was. But it was... It was a two-part two episode that he was going to appear in. Do you know whereabouts in our telling season where that mm, might have come around? Absolutely None. None. Idea. No. none. Okay. And uh, we sketched it out. We brought it to the studio. The studio looked at it just in, a, in, in broad strokes. They said, great. And then either agent, lawyer, someone from Bill's... Mm. team called up and uh, I will not even mention the number numbers <laughs> <laughs> but the number was probably it, it was probably eight times more than the studio had any interest in sure in, oh. you can only imagine I, I, I'll, I'll go I'll go a step further in a, in, a, in a slightly different direction in in the movie generations 
there's a character named Soren that Malcolm McDowell played. Mm -hmm. I got a call one day that Marlon Brando wanted to play the role. Wow. Cool. wow. And uh, I didn't get the call from Marlon Brando. I got it from his, his agent. And uh, I remember going to Sherry Lansing and she said, she kind of said, nobody's really interested in Marlon Brando anymore. It's been <laughs> years since he's done anything. But mostly, the money that he wanted was in the same area as what Shatner was talking right. about. Wow. And they were, you know, we had, uh, if you look at the Star Trek shows that are on now, uh, our budgets were just minuscule. Minuscule. Really, and compared to now. Compared to the shows that are on now. Oh. And How the movies that we made, uh, compared to, I mean, if you look at Marvel movies. Right, yeah, right. The movies we make today, uh, the movies that I was involved with, the four movies that I was involved with, were equal to the, you know, the the, the, the food budget. Right. Sure. Right. And uh, no kidding. That's why our, you know, we could just our when it came to special effects, when it came to visual effects, uh, they were always limited. We always would have a huge wall filled with fifty visual effects shots. And we have prices on all of them. And by the time the meeting was over, Bad. there would be nine <laughs> right. pieces of paper up on the wall. And I was under the some understanding that our show was not cheap. I mean, they were, you know, they, they had a budget, surely. I mean, it, I mean, I'm looking at it now, and I mean, it looks amazing. And I, the sets we used to walk into on st stage nine. The show, what, what I was saying before, the show was not cheap. But in order to get the stations interested, the license fees right. that the stations paid to get the shows were less. Mm -hmm. So the studio was making less money. Right. right. Gotcha. That, that's why, yeah, the almighty dollar bottom line is always the consideration. Yeah, indeed. So, uh, so Bill's number was just astronomical and that, that went out of the window. Yes. Um, Tim Lay from Twitter is asking, are you working on a memoir about your time on the franchise or is that just a rumor? I, it is not a rumor, uh, <laughs> but it is a writing memoir is not not all that easy and uh, takes a lot of time and a lot of a lot of focus and a lot of concentration. And the memoir that I am working on is a combination of the in, in the 17 years I made documentaries, I had far more interesting experiences in a way than producing a television show on a big studio in Hollywood. Right. Uh, so what the memoir is, is it sort of bounces back and forth between the documentary years and the Star Trek years. That's really cool. And uh, I'm about, I would say, whether you look at it as single space or double space. <laughs> in double space, I'm at about 80 pages. Huh. And I'm uh, working on it. I'd like to say every day, but uh, probably more like two, three days a week. And when did you start? What? Uh... Oh, I started a little bit of it 15 years ago and gave up on it, and then I picked up on it within the last year. Uh, you're doing this yourself? It's all you're just sitting down? Oh, yeah, room? I have not. Uh, I, I, I do There's not. There's no ghosts uh, in the room? It could be that when I'm done, they'll say, okay, now it's time for you to sit down with Joe Blow and, uh, right. and, and have it done properly. But I'm... I'm pleased with the way it's going. Good for you. Yeah. That's very cool. Sounds fascinating. What um, else we got? I guess I have a question for you. Oh. <laughs> no need, no pressure to answer. But what was uh, the hardest part and also the best part of going from documentary filmmaking to shooting episodic television? Well, in documentary filmmaking, you're working with real people. Yeah. And you're working with real people who are doing something important enough that somebody wants to make a film about them. Mm-hmm. Uh, in uh, when you're dealing with uh, television with series, you're you're working with a bunch of uh, <laughs> uh, a bunch of homeless actors. <laughs> right. They're looking for lunch. Uh, <laughs> it's like wrangling yeah, right. cats, <laughs> drunk, <laughs> drug addicted cats <laughs> who are looking for a table with bagels. On. That's right. <laughs> no, uh, I mean I I had I had my my. Uh, my love for Star Trek from beginning to end and my feelings of that I I think I was pretty true in keeping Gene Roddenberry's vision of the future 
uh, alive from beginning to end and not turning it into a, a Marvel type show where it was just nothing but action and fantasy uh, right. with, a, with a little Star Trek thrown in. No, yeah. I think uh, It's something I'm very, very proud of. But I'm also, I've, I just have, I have, uh, you know, I have, you know, great, great stories about finding myself in Palestine liberation camps in Lebanon and, and with people walking around with hand grenades. And I just, yeah. a, a, a lot of interesting stories. And I was a kid, too. I was in my 20s when I was doing that. Yeah. There was a point where Frank Mancuso, who was running the whole Paramount and, and uh, Gulf and Western or what, whatever right. it was, he was... He, he, he wanted ideas from people about things that could be done on the lot. And I sent him an idea that he bought. And I said, let's put plaques on every soundstage. Let's let people know right. when they walk by right. stage yeah. eight that Sunset Boulevard Sunset, was yes. shot here, right. that The Godfather was shot here. Yeah. And they bought it and they did it. That's the, yeah, and that's I, I will tell you that on my last day, at Paramount, which was two years after Enterprise wrapped, I was packing up, and I took a camera, and I went to every stage, uh -huh. and every stage, and most of them had some some Star Trek on them because right. yeah. we yeah. had done we had done four series and right. and seven or eight movies had been made in the original series, and uh, I took photographs of all of those plaques. Got in my car and drove home. That's that's awesome. That's a lovely oh, story, man. Yeah, yeah, I love. I remember hearing the story that um, above our trailers was the office yeah. that uh, William Holden um, visited had the for girl. Sunset Boulevard yeah. with the girl writing the the, the screenplay, and then rear window uh, was shot on eighteen. Esther Williams, the yes. swimming pool that she did a lot of her films right. in, was 18. under eighteen. It was yeah. under eighteen. Yeah. It was yeah. co covered up. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. I, I love still that. there. It was a, it was that was covered up, and we we shot on top. No kidding. Right. And, you know, movies like The so, Godfather. A couple of movies that were walking somewhat through successful. that alleyway. Yeah. I get from the car park to my trailer every morning. I go through Godfather Alley and look back at the water tower, and I would just pinch myself. Yeah. It was, uh, well, truly, uh, Halcyon you, days. You you, um, you changed our lives. Yeah. In, Thank uh, you, Rick. In putting well, I'd like to think that you guys helped change mine. Oh, well, thank you, thank a, you. It's a real honor. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a blessing, and um, and I will say that Shuttle Pod, you know, the writing, for me, the writing got extremely important part of my life in Enterprise, uh, and Brandon and I wrote a, a whole bunch of scripts, and when asked which is my favorite, I know you're not going to buy this. But Shuttle Pod Two is is Shuttle the Pod answer. One. I'm sorry, Shuttle, <laughs> Shuttle Pod no, no, no. Two. <laughs> Shuttle, Shuttle Pod Two is much better. Than <laughs> <laughs> if we had season five, we, we, we could not afford it. <laughs> there no, was going to be another one. No, Shuttle Pod Two. <laughs> Will they survive? The <laughs> Shuttle Pod One was uh, was a show that I think I, I, you, I, I might uh, literally be prouder of than just about any other one. That's really likewise. Yeah, Likewise, uh, it um, along with the pilot, which I felt very strongly about. The pilot was bloody good, man. It, was fantastic. it really was. Uh, I thought we were a terrific show. I really do. We were, and, uh, and uh, circumstance and money and a new administration yeah. is the only thing that kept us from going seven years. Yeah. yeah. Do you know? And the fans, for all their uh, slight obduracy, maybe at the beginning. We do do the cons, and over the last 10, 12 years in particular, they, they've all found this show somehow through the streaming services or through DVDs. And Netflix the helps. amount of people that come up to me now and go, you know, I never watched your show back in the day. You know, I get the same thing. You're I get, your favorite I, I show get, now. I get things on, uh, on the internet where people will say, you know, I, I didn't watch Enterprise too much, and I started watching it, and I'm watching it with my kids now, and we watch it every night. Yeah. We discuss the episodes and yeah. we discuss what they mean. And, you know, a lot of television shows are far more popular, but people don't sit as a family and, and discuss what the metaphors and, no. and, and, and what the meanings of them are. Mm -hmm. So it's something that uh, I, I, I'm very proud of and I'm proud that, that I got myself involved with uh, Mr. Roddenberry through uh, 
an, an eye roll and, and wagadoodles. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Rick. Yeah. It's been an absolute uh, honor seeing you again. Yeah. A treat. It really has. Um, God bless you, mate. Mine as well. And I might even at some point break down and, and do a... a uh, do a convention, although I've managed to keep myself away for 20 years, so I'll see if well, I you can. Well, you let us know. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll hold your hand. Okay. Bring you <laughs> in. <laughs> That's a deal. Okay, exactly. Uh, Again, thank you, you so much. Thank Ray. you so yeah. much, Rick. Yeah. 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 Thank, thank you. Hey everyone, we've got some exciting news to share. First off, thank you for all the love you've shown us so far. It's been incredible to see and hear your comments. And many of you have told us you want more. So we're launching a Patreon channel where you'll get access to uncut episodes, bonus content, and a lot more. Check out the link to Patreon in the description below and we'll keep the entertainment coming.